Well, I want to welcome everybody to the University of St. Francis. I'm Dr. Gary Bard. I'm the uh, interim dean of the School of Arts and Sciences. Uh, I, I think uh, most of you, I've, I've, I've seen all of you before. I don't, um, most of you already know about us and have a good association with us, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, if you have any questions about the university or about the programs here, we would love to answer them for all of you. So, you know, get to know our folks. We're interspersed throughout the crowd. Um, and uh, give us a chance to brag about the University of St. Francis. Um, we uh, welcome you to our lecture series. Uh, this gives us an opportunity to share with the public some of our perspectives on the uh, Franciscan way of life and the Franciscan values that we practice. And we always look forward to such an opportunity. Bef uh, how about now, if I, let, if I turn this over to Dr. Dave Fleischecker, he's the uh, uh, department chair of the Department of uh, Philosophy and Religion here at the university, and he's going to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Dr. Bard. Uh, as Dr. Bard had said, my name is David Fleischacker. Uh, I'm the chair um, of the Department of Theology and Philosophy here at St. Francis. Uh, I too would like to welcome you to the University of St. Francis and this North uh, Campus Auditorium. Today uh, we have the honor of hearing from Sister Jacinta Krasek. Sister Jacinta grew up in Lafayette, uh, Indiana, and has been a member of the Sisters of Perpetual Adoration for 23 years. The primary residence of the Sisters of Perpetual Adoration is in Mishawaka in the South Bend area, for those of you who might not know. It is a, on the grounds there is a beautiful monastery with a great spiritual life to it. And a wonderful, it has been a wonderful place that has a sincere devotion to our Lord, especially as he comes to us in the Eucharist. Whenever I visit there, uh, I find strength in their great devotion and life. Um, and one sees uh, the fruits uh, of the monastery and the growing numbers of young women who have found their vocation in this Eucharistic-centered life with Jesus Christ. Sister Jacinta will introduce to us a 13th century poem by St. Bonaventure, who is one of the great medieval figures who has been elevated to the sacred rank of a doctor or a teacher of the Church Universal. As a doctor of the church, he stands with the great teachers of the faith throughout history. From St. Athanasius and St. Ephraim the Syrian in the Eastern Early Church, to St. Augustine and St. Ambrose in the West, to St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Catherine of Siena in the late medieval era of St. Bonaventure himself, to St. Teresa of Lisieux, the little flower, who lived in the 19th century and has been the, the most recent addition to these great doctors. St. Bonaventure's 13th century poem is entitled, The Tree of Life, Lignum Vitae. Adam and Eve's betrayal barred us from that tree. Jesus reopened the doors to it in an entirely new way, in a merciful love for all of us, coming to each of us through his body, which we crucify because of our sins and hatred for the Holy Spirit and his Father and him. In Jesus' sacrifice caused by our sins, um, and as well uh, caused, in a way, by his own love for us, he asks his Father to forgive us and to bestow upon us mercy. The tree of life which nourished Adam and Eve on earth is now transformed into a self-sacrificing tree, the crucifix, that opens into the very heart of the kingdom of God in heaven. The tree of life now makes all things new. Sister Jacinta will be discussing how we meet Jesus, our Lord, in this tree. Sister Jacinta completed her undergraduate bachelor's degree at the University of Purdue in West Lafayette um, on interior design. She earned a master's degree in pastoral studies at Loyola University in Chicago in 2001, and then a master of arts degree in theology at the University of Notre Dame in 2007. Sister Jacinta currently teaches courses in prayer and worship and introduction to Catholic theology in our department. She has previous experience in a wide variety of areas in church ministry, including campus and young adult ministry, vocational discernment, and healthcare ministry. 
Sister Jacinta joined us full time this year, for which we are very grateful uh, with our whole hearts, minds, and souls. Um, I would like to introduce to you Sister Jacinta Krasek. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming out today on this first day of March between the snowflakes and the sunshine. Meeting Jesus in St. Bonaventure's Tree of Life. At first glance, we may be led to think that Jesus is up in a tree and we are climbing there to meet with him. If you saw the beautiful photograph provided for our flyer, thanks to Ken Bogaisky, of the stained glass window in the parish church of Bagnareggio, Italy, you realize that you are on the right track. After exploring some background on what is meant by Tree of Life, my plan is to share an overview of Bonaventure's work, which he has titled The Tree of Life, or Lenium Vitae. We will look briefly at St. Bonaventure's life and then proceed into why he wrote the Lenium Vitae and how it may be used in prayer to deepen our understanding and love for Jesus. To begin, I would like to invite you to join me with St. Bonaventure in praying aloud together his prayer for the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. O oh Lord Jesus, through you, I humbly beg the merciful Father to send the Holy Spirit of grace that he may bestow upon us his sevenfold gifts. May he send us the gift of wisdom which will make us relish the tree of life that is none other than yourself, the gift of understanding which will enlighten us that gift of counsel, which will guide us in the way of righteousness. And the gift of fortitude, which will give us the strength to vanquish the enemies of our sanctification and salvation. May he impart to us the gift of knowledge, which will enable us to discern your teaching, to distinguish good from evil, the gift of piety, which will make us enjoy true peace, and the gift of fear, which will make us shun all iniquity and avoid all danger of offending your majesty. To the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, be given all glory and thanksgiving forever. Amen. In examining this prayer, first of all, we recognize its Trinitarian character. We directed our prayer to the Father through Jesus Christ the Son in the Holy Spirit, and we concluded by offering praise and thanksgiving to each divine person of the Holy Trinity. Belief in the Trinity is at the core of Christian faith, being its central mystery. Bonaventure accentuates a Trinitarian theology which sees all of creation as coming forth from God the Father through the power of his spoken word, who is the Son, and in the love of the Holy Spirit. Likewise, all of creation is returning to God the Father through the Son, who is now the Word made flesh, and in the Holy Spirit. The Trinity of God is both the beginning and the end, our source and our goal. Secondly, we see in our request for the first gift, the gift of wisdom, St. Bonaventure provides us with this image of the tree of life and states that it is Jesus Christ himself. We might ask, where does this idea of the tree of life originate? And how do we know that it represents Christ? St. Bonaventure borrows the concept of the tree of life from sacred scripture. 
We find this figure in the beginning, middle, and end of the Bible, in Genesis, Proverbs, and Revelation. Let's take a look in the middle of sacred scripture at the book of Proverbs. We can see why Bonaventure has associated the tree of life with the gift of wisdom. Happy the one who finds wisdom. She is a tree of life to those who grasp her, and he is happy who holds her fast. The loss of this wisdom occurred, as we see in Genesis, with the first act of disobedience. God placed the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It has been recognized that the tree of life symbolized Adam and Eve's continued relationship with God in maintaining obedience and therefore continued bliss. By choosing to eat of the wrong tree, opting for disobedience rather than obedience, sin entered the world and separated human beings from the tree, deforming their relationship with God. We also see in Genesis that eating of the fruit of the tree of life allows one to live forever. Once human beings disobeyed God and broke the covenantal relationship with God, they were no longer free to eat from the tree and enjoy eternal life. Turning to the last book of the Bible, we find further reference to the tree of life. In the apocalyptic language of the book of Revelation, the tree of life is pictured as growing on each side of a life-giving river that flows from the throne of God. It bears fruit every month of the year, and its leaves serve as medicine. Toward the beginning of this book, we find this promise. To the victor, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life that is in the garden of God. At the end of Revelation, we encounter this warning. If anyone takes away from the words of this prophetic book, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city described in this book. We also receive this guidance. Blessed are they who wash their robes so as to have the right to the tree of life and enter the city through its gates. Here we envision a complete restoration in relationship with God and a return to the happiness of Eden. Between the beginning and the end, our origin and our destiny, we know who it is that makes it possible to wash our robes, to be restored to God and gain eternal life, only Jesus Christ. Christ, sometimes called the second Adam, reversed the disobedience of the first Adam by being obedient even to the point of death on the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ is recognized then as the new tree of life, the new way to eternal life. If the Garden of Eden is an archetype, that is a foreshadowing or prefiguring of paradise or heaven, then the tree of life is an archetype of Christ, through whom eternal life may be gained. The prayer for the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we prayed together at the beginning is actually found at the end of St. Bonaventure's work. These gifts of the Holy Spirit we requested make the following of Jesus Christ or the transformation into Christ possible. This prayer comes at the end of a series of 48 meditations written in 1260 by St. Bonaventure on the life of Jesus Christ, which he titled The Tree of Life or Lenium Vitae. Bonaventure impresses me as being quite an organized and creative person. He systematically arranged his 48 meditations into what else but a tree. 
First, he explains that there are three main divisions. These sections trace the mystery of Christ's origin and life, the mystery of his passion and death, and the mystery of his glorification. There are four branches under each section, giving us a total of 12 branches with a fruit growing on each of the 12 branches. Certainly by envisioning the 12 fruits, he has in mind the tree of life from the book of Revelation, which bears fruit every month of the year. We will come back to the fruits a little later. Bonaventure has de divided the lenium vitae into three sections. The first section includes Jesus' birth, childhood, and public ministry. The second walks us through Jesus' passion and death from his betrayal by Judas to his burial in the tomb. The third section, the mystery of his glorification, includes Jesus' triumph over death, his resurrection and ascension into heaven, Jesus' gift of the Holy Spirit given at Pentecost, his return again in glory, and the culmination of all things in Christ. In the 48th and final meditation, Bonaventure reminds us of Jesus' titles given in the book of Revelation, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He states, As all things are brought forth through the word eternally uttered, so through the word made flesh, all things are restored, impelled, and achieved. Bonaventure expresses his thoughts about Christ by then bursting into an exuberant litany of praise. His words of praise truly reflect the spirit of St. Francis, who had prayerfully exclaimed, My God and my all, after reflecting on the mystery of Jesus in his own life and himself in Christ. So we see here, as well as in other writings of Bonaventure, a likeness to his spiritual father, Francis. Let's pause momentarily for a brief look at his life as a Franciscan and theologian. St. Bonaventure was originally named Giovanni, which is John. The date of his birth is not entirely certain. It is most commonly thought that he was born in 1217, although the other date most often suggested is 1221. He grew up in Bagnoreggio, Italy. The photo shows the route that visitors take to go up to Bagnoreggio. Bonaventure was most likely acquainted with the Franciscan friars from a young age, receiving his primary education at the friary in Bagnoreggio. Around 1234, he moved to Paris to begin his professional studies in liberal arts and theology. He joined the Franciscans, the Order of Friars Minor, around the year 1243, and then continued his studies. Around 1253, he began teaching theology in the Franciscan school in Paris. Bonaventure's teaching career was interrupted when he was elected the Minister General of the Order of Friars Minor in 1257. He became the seventh leader of this branch of the Franciscan Order during a time when, when there were difficult internal factions. Bonaventure handled these with both firmness and moderation, exhibiting much wisdom even at a relatively young age. He is even hailed as the second founder of the Franciscan order. In 1273, Pope Gregory X made Bonaventure the Cardinal Bishop of Albano. He assisted the Pope and participated in the Second Council of Lyon until his sudden death on July 15, 1274. Bonaventure was canonized as saint in 1482 and in 1588 was recognized as a doctor of the church, being named the Seraphic Doctor. Along with Bonaventure's many responsibilities, he produced a wealth of writings, and his writings show us that prayer 
was of primary importance to him. Bonaventure's writings really are the fruit of his own prayer. Hence, as a brilliant theologian, he provides us with a living example of one who knew that theology and spirituality could not be separated. Over the centuries and into our times, there has sometimes been a tendency to see theology as a pursuit in itself. However, in Bonaventure's writings, he issues a warning. In the prologue of the Lenium Vitae, he states that no one can avoid the mistake of preferring the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to the tree of life, unless faith is placed before knowledge and devotion before research. A similar warning is given in his earlier writing, The Soul's Journey into God, where Bonaventure points out that investigation is not sufficient Investigation is not sufficient without wonder, understanding without humility, and interior reflection without divinely inspired wisdom. For Bonaventure, theology, or the study of God, could not exist without spirituality or the experience of God. Theology is a practical science, not something solely theoretical. Theology was a tool for Bonaventure. It was a means to help facilitate the far more important end of union with God. Why did Bonaventure write the Lenium Vitae? And can we locate clues to understand his purpose? We see that these meditations flow out of Bonaventure's own prayer and that he wants to assist his brothers and sisters in their prayer, both then and now, in our own journey back to God. From his own experience, he knows that growth in relationship with God doesn't just happen automatically. It must be desired and sought after. As Bonaventure makes clear in his earlier writing, The Soul's Journey into God, what is needed first for prayer is to be a person of desires. Rather than primarily and only focusing on negation and denying ourselves, Bonaventure stresses the need to crave God, to beg for God, to burn for God, and to desire God with all of one's heart. In becoming aware of our desires, it is important to take them deep enough to discover within ourselves the way in which they are rooted in God. Once again drawing from Bonaventure's final meditation, he states, it is a fact that all desires tend to happiness, which is a perfect state consisting in the simultaneous presence of all goods. No one reaches this state except through a final union with him who is the foundation and origin of goods, both natural and supernatural, both bodily and spiritual, both temporal and eternal. Using a tree analogy and linking it with the love poetry found in the Song of Songs, Bonaventure explains that he has gone through the groves of the Gospels and gathered up a bundle of branches, tying them together for easy grasping. They are like a sweet-smelling sachet, meant to attract one to Jesus, who is the eternal bridegroom. They are kindling that can be added to the fire to spark to life the little flame of love already present in the soul devoted to Christ. As Bonaventure summarizes in the prologue, he shares his meditations with us to enkindle an affection of this sort, to assist the mind and stamp the memory, to foster devotion and faith. Although emotions are not an end in themselves, and Bonaventure is certainly a very intellectual man, 
Still, he knows that a holistic spiritual experience can lead one to a greater understanding and deeper response to Christ. In writing the Lenium Vitae, it is believed that Bonaventure had two goals in mind. He hoped to stimulate the mind of the reader teaching about the saving work of Christ and inflame the heart of the reader with passionate words that allowed the reader to personally encounter and draw closer to the very human Jesus Christ. How does Bonaventure propose that we do this? First of all, he invites us to meditate. And secondly, he invites us to use our imagination to meditate. To begin, we'll look at what meditation is as a style of prayer. Meditation is the second of the three main expressions or styles of prayer, which are vocal, meditative, and contemplative. Most of us are probably quite familiar with vocal prayer, which involves voicing our thoughts and feelings to God. By forming words either verbalized aloud or silently within, we express our inner self to God in forms of praise, thanks, sorrow and repentance, and in petition for our own needs and for the needs of others. Meditation, then, is a quest to understand and respond to what the Lord is asking. We hear or read sacred scripture or other spiritual writings and ponder the mysteries of Christ. Bonaventure instructs his readers to consider attentively and turn over and over in your mind each one of the things that are said of Jesus. Rather than skimming quickly, We are to ruminate or chew on what we read, attempting to gain all the spiritual nourishment possible. We receive input and let it question us. In meditation, we can also reflect on sacred art or history, and we can allow the works of creation to point beyond themselves as they reveal attributes of their creator. We make what we encounter our own by confronting it with the reality of ourselves. Contemplation is the simplest expression of prayer in which no words, thoughts, or images are needed. It is simply to be with God in a gaze of faith and silent love. Rather than using the mind, it involves an act of the will a desire for loving union with God, and a choice to make time and space for God in one's heart. We can prepare for the experience and make ourselves available, but the actual encounter is a gift from God, taking us beyond what we can humanly achieve. With God's grace, we are taken up into the mystery of love, and God transforms us from within. In real life, these three styles of prayer are often intertwined. One period of prayer may include both vocal and meditative prayer and draw us toward an experience of contemplative prayer. This is what is known traditionally as Lectio Divina, an ancient process of prayer that is rooted in Judaism and has been a part of Christianity since its earliest years. Lexio Divina means divine reading, and it typically begins by taking a passage from scripture or another spiritual source and reading it, as indicated at top left. Then one allows time to meditate on the passage as previously described, questioning and pondering what the Lord is saying. The oratio is then a dialogue with the Lord using vocal prayer and includes any effective, that is, emotional response, which also becomes a part of one's prayer. If one comes to a resolution of some kind, 
a call to put into action what one has received in prayer, then that decision would be a part of this stage. Finally, in making oneself available for a contemplative experience, the prayer becomes quiet and still, allowing one to simply rest in the Lord's presence. The whole process is not rigid, but more of a fluid movement. The beauty of viewing this process in a circle rather than in linear steps aids in understanding this fluidity and that one may really begin the period of prayer at any point on the circle, depending on what is needed at the time. For instance, if one comes to this time with the Lord needing to vent first, then one can begin with vocal prayer before quieting down to listen to and receive the word. The first steps of Lectio Divina are designed to move the believer toward contemplation and a deep relationship with Christ. One may approach contemplation as much as possible through Lectio, Meditatio, and Oratio, but then one simply must wait on the Lord with a heart disposed to receive contemplatio as the gift that it is. If our ultimate goal is heaven, that is, union with God, then the aim of Lexio Divina, of making time and space for prayer, is to be drawn toward that union as much as possible, even here on earth. While contemplation is an experience of transcendence, it is not an escape from the world around us. Rather, any true encounter with God is meant to expand our vision of reality and gift us with God's all-embracing love so that the Lord may make a difference in the world through each one of us. Bonaventure's writing is a result of his own experience of Lexio Divina. He was inspired by both sacred scripture and the spiritual meditations of previous writers, such as Bernard of Clairvaux, Elred of Rival, and Eckbert of Schonau. Yet he made it personally his own. Scholars refer to this process as meditative appropriation. Bonaventure's prayerful meditation on these texts was so interiorized that it came out reshaped as his own. And surely his desire is that the same sort of meditative appropriation will result from other readers' encounter with the lenium vitae, in which the reader makes his own, not just the words of the text, but the experience those words try to convey. Bonaventure invites us to use the lenium vitae in prayer as he used the resources available to him to allow the Lord to speak to our hearts. Within our period of prayer, Bonaventure invites us to use our imagination. In the prologue, he explains, because imagination assists understanding, I have arranged in the form of an imaginary tree the few passages selected from many and have disposed them in such a way that in the first and lower branches the Savior's origin and life are described. In the middle branches, his passion, and in the top branches, his glorification. Growing from the tip of each branch hangs a single fruit. Thus we have, as it were, twelve fruits in accordance with the mystery of the tree of life. Then he continues. Picture in your mind, in your imagination, a tree. Suppose its roots to be watered by an eternally gushing fountain that becomes a great and living river. Let there be twelve fruits endowed with all delights and conforming to every taste offered to God's servants as a food 
that they may eat forever, being satisfied but never growing weary of its taste. What is this fruit? The fruit is simply the love of Christ that refreshes and strengthens. As Bonaventure explains, all of the fruit comes from the one tree, but it grows on different branches and has 12 different flavors according to the particular consolation or nourishment that is aroused in the soul who meditates upon them. We have to climb the tree to pick and eat the fruits. By eating the fruits, the graces God gives us, we receive the life of Christ and allow it to become part of us. Bonaventure asserts that their full flavor refreshes and their rich substance strengthens the soul who meditates upon them and carefully considers each one. Bonaventure identifies these various consolations which the Lord may provide. For instance, by meditating on Jesus' origin, his birth and childhood, we may taste of his illustrious ancestry, his sweetness, and humility. By thoughtfully considering Jesus' public ministry, we may taste of his power and perfect virtue and the fullness of his abundant kindness and love. By pondering Jesus' passion and death, we may taste of his heroism, his patience under severe mistreatment and insult, his fortitude under torture, and finally, the victory he achieved for us through the sacrifice of his redemptive death, that in dying, he destroyed death itself. In meditating on the mysteries of Jesus' glory, we may taste the wonder of his resurrection, how sublime is his ascension into heaven, from which he poured forth the gift of the Holy Spirit, and all the graces for the life of the church and for the ministry of building up the body of Christ. Lastly, we may taste of the equity of his judgment and the eternity of his kingdom. In introducing the lenium vitae, Bonaventure declares that one's understanding is aided by use of imagination. In his earlier writing, the soul's journey into God, Bonaventure lists imagination as one of the six faculties or powers of the soul which help us draw closer to God. The imagination is a gift from God which enables the faithful person to transcend his or her physical reality and interiorly ascend to God. There are various ways to meditate and Bonaventure invites us to use a method called a composition of place meditation. Composition of place means composing a visual image in one's mind of a place where Jesus was, using one's imagination to enter into the biblical scene as fully as possible. It is recognized that the meditations of Anselm of Canterbury present the beginnings of what later came to be known as composition of place meditation. Bonaventure's lenium vitae is seen as the forerunner of the meditations that were developed some 200 years later by Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits. St. Ignatius made extensive use of composition of place meditation in his spiritual exercises which are commonly used by retreat directors today. A composition of place meditation involves employing one's feelings and even one's senses in the imagining. One may ask, if I were there as part of this biblical scene, what would I experience? For example, if I were in Bethlehem at the stable when Christ was born, what would I see? What would I hear? What would I smell? 
what would I feel? What is the Holy Spirit inviting me to experience through the gift of my imagination? Even if we have heard or read a particular gospel passage many times before, by entering into it this way, we may become aware of something we never noticed before about Jesus, the people he touched, and about ourselves. In a composition of place meditation, we allow the historical event to come alive for us once again, that we may tap into its spiritual power. In other words, God's grace is not limited by our dimension of time and space. We earthlings count minutes, hours, days, years. We see time as measurable, sequential, chronological, or what the ancient Greeks referred to as chronos. However, the Greeks also gave us a word to describe another way of viewing time, kairos. Kairos is God's time, the supernatural, undetermined, qualitative, opportune moment or appointed time when God acts. Kairos is the eternal now that we hear proclaimed in the liturgy each Ash Wednesday. Behold, now is a very acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Although our salvation was accomplished through specific actions by God at definite times and places, the Christian use of time enables us to commemorate and experience again those very acts on which salvation is grounded. Through our present remembering and entering into the events of salvation history, we are given anew the benefits of, of what God has done for us in these past events. The church gives us our present liturgical season of Lent to specifically reflect on what Jesus did for us through his suffering and death. But any time is a good time to remember Jesus' saving deeds. Those of us who are familiar with the way of the cross devotion know that the religious imagination comes into play in this form of prayer. These stations or scenes depicting Jesus' journey to Calvary are depicted in art forms here on campus in both the St. Francis Chapel and also outdoors on this west side of Pope John Paul II Center next to Mirror Lake. In the way of the cross, we may use sacred art, words from scripture, written meditations, and sometimes music to help us enter into Jesus' experience. In the Middle Ages, Bonaventure contributed significantly to the devotional writings about Christ's passion. He describes Jesus' suffering in graphic detail. And as one author noted, he is among the first writers to write about Mary's mental anguish at Christ's suffering. As mentioned previously, Bonaventure's Lenium Vitae is divided into three parts. He makes the section on the passion of Christ the core or heart of the entire work. Consistent with his other writings, he is again revealing his conviction that the cross of Christ must be at the center. With the modern use of media, the story of Christ's passion has been vividly portrayed on the big screen. Those of us who have seen the 2004 Passion of the Christ movie or the 1977 Jesus of Nazareth series by Franco Zeffirelli may attest that such scenes can powerfully feed the imagination and enable us to more deeply understand what Jesus freely chose to experience for our sake.
At this point, I would like to share a particular meditation with you from the Lenium Vitae. This is meditation number 18, depicting Jesus' agony in the garden. I invite you to allow yourself to enter into it and let the Lord speak to you as much as possible at this time and in this place. To do so, you may want to readjust yourself in your seat, take a few slow, deep breaths, and even close your eyes if you wish. We will have a moment of quiet at the end, and then I will gently bring us back. Jesus, prostrate in prayer. Jesus, therefore, knowing all that was to come upon him in accordance with the dispositions of the Most High, led his apostles in the recitation of a hymn and went out to Mount Olivet. There he prayed to his father, as was his custom. But at this particular moment, with the agony of death approaching, with the flock which the gentle shepherd had so tenderly nurtured about to be scattered and left without a leader, the vision of death became so frightening to Christ's sensible nature that he cried out, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass away from me. With the intensity of anguish that for many reasons pressed upon the Redeemer's spirit is shown by the sweat of blood which so abundantly ran to the ground from every pore of his body. Almighty Lord Jesus, why such torment in your soul? Why such an anguished plea? Did you not offer to the Father an entirely willing sacrifice? It was to strengthen us in faith by the knowledge that you did truly share our mortal nature. To lift us up in hope when we ourselves must endure hardships, and to give us greater incentives to love you. It was for these reasons that you showed the natural weakness of the flesh in such evident signs, making us understand how truly you have carried our sorrows, how really your senses suffered from the bitterness of your passion. You may slowly open your eyes and gently come back. In this particular meditation, Bonaventure focuses on Christ's humanity and his intense anxiety over his approaching death. He visualizes what we are told in scripture, that Jesus agonized to the point that his sweat even turned to drops of blood. Bonaventure shares his own prayer with us as he questions Jesus, asking why, striving to more deeply understand the meaning of this event. Then he shares with us the response he received. Jesus endured all that he did, Bonaventure says, to shape us in faith, to lift us up in hope, and to give us greater incentives to love. Jesus joins us in our sufferings, not only to repair the damage created by evil, but also to show us the way and to encourage us in these three theological virtues. Christ is both redeemer in his combat with evil and exemplar in showing us how to live. 
In telling a story, as Bonaventure has done in recounting the events of Jesus' life, the narrative is endowed with meaning. Bonaventure's reading of his own encounter with Jesus in prayer takes us a step further into understanding Jesus' story. Bonaventure is recognized as the master of the theological short story, and the lenium vitae is viewed as a theological short story, which, like the parables of Jesus, has the power to speak to the heart as well as the head, challenging one on a deeper level, calling for conversion and a change of one's life. Stories engage the movie projector of the mind and touch the imagination. They allow us to experience situations from another point of view, provoking insight and new ways of seeing our world. For there can be no conversion without a change of perspective. Every profound change of heart entails a different way of looking at the world. Imaginative prayer involves trusting that God is at work through our imagination and through whatever emotions or insights we may experience. Even if nothing seems to be happening, by choosing to spend time with Jesus in the Gospels, his grace can be at work and spiritual transformation may be taking place at a deeper level within us, although, although we are not consciously aware of it at the time. I have found that a number of our students particularly like using a composition of place imaginative style of prayer. For most, it is something new that they haven't experienced previously, allowing them to encounter the story of Jesus in a different and fresh way. Sometimes it is art students with vivid imaginations who can most easily visualize themselves in the story. Bonaventure's Tree of Life provides such a means for meeting up with Jesus Christ, and after that encounter, never being quite the same again. Thank you. Yes, the, the little circles hanging from the branches were, um, well, I think it's too small to see, but there are illustrations. There's actually 48. There's one for each meditation. What a If you um, if you do a Google search, or actually on, under Google, you can go to images, and then put in Tree of Life. Um, this one is um, Pacino di Baraguida, uh, something like that. It's it's um, in Florence, in, in among the art pieces in Florence. Those are the, yes, there's 48 circles there, and, and each meditation is pictured in there. Sister Anita? Um, could you tell the listeners where they might find the text of the Tree of Life? Unfortunately, I haven't been able to find an online version. Um, but what you can do is um, find a book uh, online, advertised online, of the writings of Bonaventure. And um, there are some, some good texts that, that within the books that are 
of his writings uh, will include the tree of life in there. God bless you. All right. Sister Anita? This isn't a question so much as a comment. I just want to thank you, Sister, because I think what you've given us is um, uh, an apt meditation, particularly for Lent, and um, a good tool for inner conversion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. God bless you.